Excellent. Okay. Well, I'd like to get us formally underway. Um, my name is Michael Diamond, and I'm the Academic Director of the Marketing and Communications Department uh, within NYU School of Professional Studies in its divisions of programs in business. And it gives me uh, absolute delight, uh, as we are now doing on a, on a very regular basis, to uh, both thank George Benaroya uh, for pulling together and putting together this wonderful series of conversations around leading global growth, and, and to welcome to our community uh, of marketers and PR professionals and students and faculty and friends, um, Kevin Lansbury. Uh, Kevin, as I'm sure many of you now know uh, or know at this point, uh, is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer for Disney's Parks, Experiences and Products Division. And he is a 32-year veteran uh, of Disney, having held uh, a series of very interesting positions of responsibility around the world and across, across the company. Uh, Disney is one of those companies like Apple and Alex, uh, a very revered brand studied by many uh, respected in the business community for what they've been able to build and, and the brand they've been able to maintain. Um, and George does a wonderful job with his students um, every semester, in fact, two or three times a semester, sort of deconstructing uh, uh, the financial side uh, of, of the uh, company's experiences that they study uh, in the context of training emerging marketing and PR professionals, because we think you know, understanding the language of business is very important for marketing and PR professionals. So, so without further ado, uh, I, I, I want to thank everybody involved in pulling uh, this event together. Uh, I'm sure including Kevin's colleagues at Disney and uh, my colleagues at the school, uh, Robin and, and Patrick, and hand this back off. I'm always fascinated by this question, um, which is, you know, when we interview uh, leaders from around um, you know, around the world and various different industries is, you know, you probably didn't wake up 32 years ago and say, you know, I want to be the EVP at uh, Disney running parks and products, uh, or maybe you did, but um, what, what was your sort of broad journey to get there to, uh, to, the, to where you are? What, what motivated you in the past? I see you have a, you know, undergrad and an MBA, so you're obviously thinking business, I guess. Yeah. So I, I will tell you, I started, or I came to the company with absolutely no brand affinity to Disney. And I grew up in Indiana, small town, and I, I had never seen a Disney movie or been to a Disney park before I went to work for the company. My senior year in college, though, I saw a, a documentary you may remember this, and there was also a book out called In Search of Excellence. And this book and this documentary spoke to companies that were the best in class in their industries. And one of the things that I wanted to get and that I made sure I, wanted, I, I was chasing as part of a career was getting into a company that was gonna provide a very strong foundation for wherever I would want to go, three years, five years, whatever later, and Disney was since Disney was one of those companies um, uh, that had been profiled. It was a company that I just pursued. Um, I took the only job I could get, which was an accounting clerk. Um, so I moved from Indiana with nothing but a job as a as, a, as a, an accounting clerk and started out at that level. One of the things I traditionally tell people that are graduating is, look, take the job, take any job almost at a company. If that's, if that's the company you decide you want to be in, take it. If you're good at what you do and you're really good, you're going to move up through that organization over time. But pick the lane you want to swim in or you want to run in and stick to it as opposed to just sort of sprinkling it around all over the place. There's a lot of value, I think, in getting that first job and having it with a company where you're going to get that foundation. Now, starting out as a clerk, I clearly, I wasn't building that much of a foundation, but I was building a reputation. And it was a reputation that enabled me to get the foundation that I wanted over time. And the reality is I've stayed for almost 36 years now. And I have, you know, I, I've been challenged. I've been able to do 
a multitude of different things in my career at Disney, and it's worked out really well. I think that's wonderful, Council, you know, both uh, to find some depth and expertise early in your career, but also I think more about the reputation, you know, building a reputation as a trusted colleague and a strategic advisor, etc. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Lansbury. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm sorry you cannot see me, but um, before I ask my question, I would like to say that I visited um, Parisian um, Disneyland three times when I was a kid, when I was a teen, and when I was an adult, which was a perfect way to uh, kind of understand the Disneyland. And I must say that every time it was perfect. So my how do you approve an Just before you ask your question, uh, why don't you share your name and, and where you're from? Just because uh, uh, we literally can't see you. So it'd be lovely to hear your name. Yeah. My name is Anastasia. I was born in Ukraine, grew up in the Czech Republic in Prague. And uh, if I can start with my question, it would be how do you approve an investment in new themed rides and so I'm going to talk a little bit about ride development, sort of how that process works. So ideas come from literally all over the company. And, you know, it's one of the great things about Disney is you, we've got so many creative folks, uh, both in our movie studios and our WDI team and our parts groups, you know, all, all over. And so ideas are coming in for rides, but it really kind of starts with the idea. What is, what is it? And then how do you marry that up with the needs of a particular site? By the way, you may be designing a ride and not have a park for it to go into right away. Or you may have a situation where a given park is specifically looking for something. So this is a, sometimes it's a push and sometimes it's a pull, right? And you've got to, you had to recognize that ideas don't come from just one place. But when I, by the time all of that is developed and we're beginning to look at a ride, we're looking at everything from, all right, what sort of capacity is it going to add? How do we think about how it's going to fit into a broader park? Because it's going into a park with I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 other attractions that may be in a given park. So how is it going to begin to work in there? And then, you know, we're building a p &L for the park. We're working through what the investment in the park is, or the investment in the ride is going to be for it to go into that park. And then running all of our financial analysis, consumer analysis and testing with them to ensure that, okay, if we do something with this type of IP, how is it going to resonate with the guests that go to that park already? Is it going to bring in a new set of folks? We're, you know, we're testing and playing with it all the way along. So it's not a linear process. It is oftentimes a very circular process that just continues to build upon itself as we work our way through it. And sometimes what may, we may have started developing this for Disneyland and recognize, okay, this is gonna actually work better in a place like Hong Kong or Shanghai or Paris or well, Disney World. So you're kind of working your way through it. There was a question about how long it takes to, to actually build an attraction. I would say it varies. You know, it can vary anywhere from a year to, you know, six years, depending upon just how complex it is. Great. So, Rusty, go right ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Lansbury. Thank you for joining us today. I'm, I'm Rusty Thakur. I'm from India. I was raised in Indonesia. <clears throat> And the first time I made an international trip, it was to Disneyland Hong Kong. And the second big moment of my life was during my grade 12 graduation. The night I graduated, we flew to Orlando and that was the second time I visited Disneyland. Um, so thank you, I've had amazing memories and I hope to make new ones of my <laughs> here at Disneyland. Uh, my question for you today is, what is the fastest and most effective way of expanding a company as large as me? Could it be via mergers and acquisitions or building a division of your own from scratch? Well, I would say a merger or acquisition is certainly much faster, right? It's, it's faster to grow that way. It's not always better. Sometimes it is. 
but it's it's generally always faster than starting up something new because when we look at starting something new, remember I said it could, if you're building an attraction, it could take a year to six years to to build something new. Starting an entirely new theme park or a new business venture typically takes even longer. But there are pros and cons to both, right? And uh, we, uh, on the parks side of things, we have tended to grow more organically. Our studios and on the other side of the house, if you will, it's not mine, but on the other side of the house, has tended to grow more through acquisitions. And you can think about what we've done with Pixar and Marvel and Lucas and um, most recently Fox, where we've been able to grow those areas very quickly, but grow them through acquisition. So there's a mix of both in our company, um, but it is typically faster to do it through acquisition than it is um, it, once you know what you want to acquire. Anyway, sometimes it can take quite a bit of time to do the research figure out what you might want to acquire and what's possible to acquire also. So that all factors into it. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, the next question is something that I think will be helpful for small businesses and also for, oh no, <laughs> not what I look like. That's when I was 15 and I didn't speak English, where I learned that you know, to enjoy Disney, actually you don't know how to speak English. But um, let's go back to uh, the fixed uh, cost question. So, you know, one thing that I suppose we learned uh, during the pandemic is how to manage uh, companies with very large fixed costs. And also, what did we learn in terms of how do we welcome and encourage customers and clients back? So here's what I would tell you about learnings. Number one, uh, and I'm going to start with this, you know, we were we are much more resilient than we probably ever gave ourselves credit for. Um, I think as a company and as a division, we have been able to bounce back from this far faster than we, we thought ever possible. Um, you know, when we went into COVID, there were clearly some very concerning days as, as we kind of worked our way through what was happening. And we had to make some very difficult calls with respect to you know, the people, because when you look at our cost base, you look at a cost base for a theme park or resorts, there's a big chunk of this that's heavily fixed, right? It's the depreciation from the assets that are in the ground. You pay property taxes. You still got to pay the insurance. You still got to pay the lights and utilities and everything else that it takes, and you still got to maintain them even though they're maybe closed. So all of those are sort of fixed costs associated with it. You've also got what I would consider to be semi-fixed costs associated with if you open the doors at all, you have to have people there and you have to have a lot of people there. So, uh, you know, those semi-fixed costs, we had to do, you know, we had to, make some of the toughest decisions we've ever made. And Bob Chapik was you know, brand new into his role and had to make a, make a call about furloughing you know, tens of thousands of cast members, which was awful. Um, but we've learned from all of this just how resilient I think we are. Um, you know, I think we've done a great job of building back and bringing people back. Uh, but it, it, it was clearly a challenge. It was a challenge that, you know, had you asked us in advance of all of this happening, you know, what would happen? I don't know that we could have imagined uh, the situation that we were in and how we would get through it, but we found ways to get through it. So um, uh, I'd say resiliency is probably the single biggest learning. You know, if we can come back from that, we can come back from just about anything. Great, the next question is from Niharika. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Mansbury. It is a pleasure to be given this opportunity. So thank you for taking out the time for us. So um, my question for you is that, how do you measure the revenue impact of a branding activity or campaign? 
For example, running ads on social media versus billboards for a newly renovated, uh, let's say, Disney resort? Yep. So we measure every aspect of what we do from a marketing standpoint. The old adage of, you know, you know you're spending a bunch in marketing and, you know, half of it's working, but you don't know which half. Um, those days are long gone. <laughs> and I think most companies today are measuring the impact uh, of just about everything, everything that they're doing in marketing. And measurement has kind of become the, you know, buzzword, if you will, within marketing and ensuring that what you're doing is get it, you're getting the value that you want from it. And then we look at the mix of all of this, right? And it does take a mix. It's not just, you can't just do social media and completely ignore TV in our world because TV does, you know, helps us in certain ways. Social media helps us in other ways. And you got to build the, you got to build models that sort of help you understand where you're getting value, but where, where you're getting the value at which points in the supply chain, if you will, and supply chain is not the right word, but the, you know, the, the consumer chain. So that you're looking at, you know, how's the funnel, the top of the funnel being filled versus the bottom of the funnel. And you have different types of, ways of addressing the potential consumer out there and you're help, you're looking at the different ways and measuring the different ways that you can touch them at each level of the purchase process. So we're measuring every single aspect of that as we go through. Thanks the next question from Raisa. <clears throat> Hello. Good afternoon, Mr. Lesberry. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here today with us. My name is Raisa Carmen Ali. I was born and raised in Venezuela. And before I ask you the question, I just wanted to share with you that I have gone to Disney Park throughout my life since I was a little girl. And then I had the opportunity to move to the U.S. to Miami, Florida, where I was living there for 10 years. So I was fortunate to be very close to Orlando Disney Parks. So I went once or twice per year with my friends and family. The experience there was excellent every time that we went. As you can see in my picture, even in pandemic times, I was there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, thank you. Yeah, so I just wanted to thank you really because I know the hard effort and the support that is behind. And it's really a magic and happy place to be. One of my greatest memories have been in Disney. I know that I will carry them throughout my life. So thank you so much for being part of it. So now I'm gonna ask you my question. Yep. So how is Disney giving added value to customers considering the price increase in parks? Thank you. So we are providing more newer, more complex attractions and shows in our parks. Um, and if you step back and you look at what we have added over the past several years, you've got stuff like Galaxy's Edge that has come into uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios. We've got Tron that is being built in the Magic Kingdom. We've added the uh, Pandora area and Animal Kingdom. We're completely redoing Epcot. Um, and the attractions that we're building today tend to be considerably more complex and expensive than the attractions of, let's say 20, 30 years ago, because consumers are expecting new ways for us to tell stories. And so we're telling them in new and more interesting ways, but they happen to be you know, ways that um, uh, cost quite a bit to deliver. Um, in addition to that, we're adding experiences like the Skyway that we've put into, the Skyliner um, that we've put into uh, the Walt Disney World area, Avengers Campus going into Dis Disneyland. So you add, you know, you start adding a lot of these different experiences. And realistically, the only way to, to get more, to continue to grow and to get more out of them is to help increase, is to increase the price as part of it. So we look at that, um, you know, I know there's a question in here about setting prices on attractions and things of that nature. And when we look at pricing, we tend to look at it from all angles. 
Uh, you know, we're looking at what the competition is doing. We're looking at it relative to other things you could do. And I would encourage you to kind of look around at different types of experiences and the amount of time that you get out of them relative to a Disney park. Because I think our the experience that we give in our parks is, is pretty, pretty strong relative to a lot of other uh, things that you could be looking at given the amount of time you're allowed to do it. So, you know, you think about what it may cost to go to an NBA game or a baseball game or a football game. You look at what it may cost to go skiing. Um, you look at just about anything today. I think we measure up really well relative to a lot of other um, things that are out there. Thanks so much. I think we go to the next question. We just record it. That was nice to go. Hi, Mr. Lansbury. My name is Roxanne Zhang. I'm a grad student here at NYU. I would like to start by thanking you for coming to speak with us today. It is a great opportunity for us young professionals to learn from someone like you. So personally, I'm a big fan of Disney. I've been to a few locations over the years. For example, Disney in Shanghai, in Tokyo, and in California. And they're all amazing in their own ways. But it does make me wonder, how does Disney set the prices for the merchandises and the tickets at these different countries? What kind of research and analysis go into making those decisions? Thank you. <clears throat> Lots of research and analysis, and it's different by country and by, by site. Um, and you'll even see different prices even within the United States between Walt Disney World and Disneyland on various things. Um, in some cases, they are set universally. In some cases, they are set locally. And we try to ensure that the prices that we're setting are in line with what we are seeing a, on a local basis, if you will. So lots of research in terms of what is happening in a local area. But we also look at, from time to time anyway, we're looking at what does it cost us to make this. We try not to set the price on the basis of simply what it costs. And we try not to because you can end up with some, some really odd priced things relative to what the market may charge in, a, in any given area. So we're, we tend to be looking more at the market and what we think we can push but we also use a lot of decision science in terms of trying to get that to work on those prices. So we are looking at we running test test um, uh, tests from various times on okay if we raise the price this much on this item what happens you know what happens not only to it but what sort of an impact does it have on all of the other items that may be in a given store and then. Within that, how does that sort of translate across the entire theme park or the entire resort that may be there? So we're looking at it from a whole lot of different angles to ensure that what we're doing is the right thing. Next one is from Marina. Hi, Mr. Lesberry, I'm Arena Liu. Thank you so much for coming to our class and give us a chance to ask your question. Mm -hmm. Due to the time difference, I couldn't join the meeting synchronously. So here's my question. Shanghai Disney launched Lina Bell last year, a new character that has become the main reason that people visit Shanghai Disney. Related products sell at a high price in the secondhand market. Mm -hmm. Unlike Mickey Mouse, Linabel did not come out of Disney's animation, but still represent Disney. What was the strategy behind Linabel, which is undoubtedly a success for Shanghai Disney? Will Disneyland continue to introduce new characters? If yes, do you think it will achieve with the same results in other countries? I'm looking forward to hear your answers. Thank you. All right. So um, Linabel, is a character in the Duffy franchise. And Duffy is a character that was developed in the US but never really took off here. Um, so it, it, it literally did, didn't take off in the US. But it did take off 
in Tokyo. And so to, to, um, Lena, well, Duffy is set up as a, is a very strong character in Tokyo and Hong Kong and in Shanghai. Lena Bell is a line extension on the Duffy franchise. Um, it is, you know, it has done exceptionally well. As she said, there are a lot of people going to Shanghai Disney today um, and to Tokyo so that they can interact with these characters. It's still, we do have it in the U.S., but we don't have it to any great degree, and it's nowhere near the success domestically that it is internationally. But Lena Bell is simply an extension on the Duffy franchise that has done exceptionally well in Asia, not quite as well in the United States, but it's a huge smash hit in Asia. The next one is from Anna, and I think we have two pictures from Anna. So that's one. We have another one. Okay. Go ahead. Hello, Mr. Lansbury. My name is Anna Hersky. It's an honor to meet you. I sincerely thank you for speaking with us today. Most of us are longtime Disney fans. I know I don't only speak for myself when I say that this feels unreal. I was five years old when I first visited Disney World. Watching my favorite characters come to life was indescribable imagination fuel. Experiencing my favorite park, Epcot, particularly the World Showcase, and in, I'm sorry, ignited my insatiable curiosity about the people and cultures inhabiting our world. Actually, every time I visit Disney World, I have to visit Epcot at least twice. I grew up with the goal to visit every Disney park in the world. I studied abroad in Shanghai and visited Shanghai Disneyland. I was also a foreign exchange student in Fukuoka, Japan, and visited Tokyo Disney Sea. With that said, the question is, since Disney is a culturally diverse company, reaching many parts of the globe with, it, with an incredible level of international awareness, have there been any particularly challenging or interesting cultural barriers when expanding? Thank you. Yes, I'll give you a little case study on one um, that I happened to live through, uh, and it was Disneyland Paris. And I think we've been pretty public over the years with, with this one, but you know, Disneyland Paris was a, a situation we kind of tried to lift and shift, you know, what we did at Walt Disney World to a great degree, and put it into Paris. We didn't do a lot of research on uh, on what it was going to take to make it successful in that market. And we paid a pretty high price for it. And we were, you know, called the cultural Cher Chernobyl at one point, um, which was by the French, French government, some folks in the French government. Uh, and it took a long time for us to recover uh, from that. And we had to get a lot more French. I think when you saw us go into Shanghai was very done, done very differently. And there was a lot of research done on the, on that market. And we, we spent a lot of time trying to ensure that we understood that market. We understood the consumers and what they wanted. So a lot went into ensuring that those aspects worked really, really well. And um, I think we, those learnings from Paris helped us both in Hong Kong, but probably most importantly, helped us in Shanghai as we went into the business there. And I think we did, we did a much better job in Shanghai than we did in Paris. Next one is from Marielle. Hi, Mr. Lansbury and everyone that's joining us today for the chat. Um, Thank you, first of all, for allowing us to learn from you today. I'm Maria Alejandra Bloch. I'm from Lima, Peru. And unlike many of my friends, uh, the first time that I actually visited this day was when I was 21 for my 21st birthday. I come from a middle class family. So for the whole year, me, my mom, my dad, and my brother saved up uh, enough money to travel there. And I have to say it was one of the best experience ever. Uh, not only because the attractions are insane and they're so much fun, but because everyone there treats you like family. And I hold that memory deeply in my heart. <clears throat> so my question for you is, how does Disney approach entering a market where they are no, not necessarily the leaders or Disney not the first? Thank you so much. 
uh, we approach it with a lot of re market research. Um, so, uh, you know, you could take Shanghai as a great example. Um, and, you know, I just talked a, a little bit about that, but we spent a lot of time ensuring that we understood that market and what it was going to take to be successful in that market. Uh, we wanted to be authentically Disney, but we also wanted to be distinctly Chinese. And I think that was a phrase that Bob Iger coined. Uh, but we wanted to ensure that what we were doing was going to appeal to that market. And when you look at that park, it is distinctly different than any of our other parks anywhere in the world. It is a castle park, and there is a big castle, castle there. By the way, the biggest castle we've ever built. Um, but it is different. There's not a Main Street USA like there is in every other part, every other site that we've developed anywhere. Um, and when you look at the food, when you look at the merchandise, when you look at all aspects of what we put in from an area development standpoint, it is authentically Chinese. And we want, we felt like we needed that aspect to ensure that what we were developing there really hit the mark with consumers and it has proven successful. So um, I think if we were going to be doing any more parts anytime soon, we would probably be doing something with a lot more research of that type. But it, it, it just speaks to the fact that you've really got to take the time to ensure that what you're developing is going to hit the market. And it takes a tremendous amount of market research to do that. Next one is uh, from Ben. <coughs> oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Mr. Lansbury. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for your time here. Uh, I'm from China, and my question is Disney has a solid family brand strategy. So, how do you the risk from business partners, such as merchandise licensees, to my potentially damage that reputation? And what does Disney evaluate to decide whether to in-house or outsource? Thank you. So in terms of working with partners, and you know, there and I'm just gonna sort of couch it in that broad umbrella, if you will. If we're gonna work with a partner, they're gonna need to bring something that we don't to the party, right? If this is something we can do, we've got the money to go do on our own we're probably gonna to choose to do it on our own. Um, but we were also at the same time recognize we don't have expertise in everything. And to grow that expertise in house can take A, a lot of money, but B, a long time. And so sometimes it makes sense to work with a licensee or work with a partner. We do a lot of research on that partner, that licensee, whatever the related business relationship may be, um, to ensure that we are working with someone who is going to be able to represent our brand well. Because to your point, we do have an exceptionally strong brand. And ensuring that you're developing a brand, uh, you hang on to that very strong brand and continue to strengthen it requires you to take the time to ensure that every single thing you do is brand accretive, not necessarily detracting from the brand. So anybody that we're working with, we're trying to ensure that that brand, they've got the same brand construct that we do and the same attention to detail in the brand. Um, you know, when we're looking at insourcing or outsourcing something, you, you go through all the cost benefit analysis of insourcing and outsourcing, but at the same time, Think about speed to market. You can think about expertise. Do we have this sort of expertise in-house? Can we grow it in-house? If we want to grow it in-house, how long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? Is it easier to just go buy it than it is to, you know, uh, to uh, try and develop it? So you're looking at these sort of things from numerous angles, not just one, um, but trying to come at it from a whole bunch of angles going forward. Okay. Hi, Mr. Lansbury. First of all, thank you for your time and being with us here. I'm, I'm from Mexico, and I remember when I was growing up, 
just replaying and replaying Fantasia 2000. And a year later, my dad and my mom took me to Disney World. And obviously, the first thing I wanted was to go into the live show. And when I watched it, I was really the happiest kid on earth. And probably that experience is one of the best ones I've had ever. And talking about experience and happiness, as a designer, we're thought to think about the customer experience. <coughs> a company that creates happiness, what would be the value of personalized customer experience? And how would you measure customer experience in terms of revenue and financial impact? Thank you. Okay, so this one's a little more complex at times, but we do measure customer experience. So we're measuring the what we consider to be the guest experience in our parks and resorts. And we do that through a tremendous amount of survey work. Uh, some of it on site, some of it when people get home, but we are constantly asking our guests what they think of what we're providing. And we ask it from a, a you know, a, tremendous amount of different angles. But what we're trying to do is be able to go in and dissect the guest experience and understand what's tr what truly matters to them. Um, and, you know, oftentimes we're measuring, all right, so how much does this aspect of the guest experience have on the entire overall guest experience? Because it's important to understand that not every question that you're gonna ask is created equal or has the same impact with the guest in terms of what they're doing. So you're breaking down the guest experience into much smaller, more granular ways of looking at it. And you're looking at it through their eyes and asking for their feedback back on it. And then you're taking all of that information, compiling it and putting it all back together to tr truly understand, all right, what are our guests telling us? By the way, what they're telling us and what the financial results are could be two different things. And you gotta be careful about how you begin to connect some of those things and how you think about those playing out over time. So one doesn't always mean that the other aspect of it's gonna be successful. So you've really gotta to begin to tear it apart. And then financially, we're looking at each of those experiences and we are breaking those down into smaller and smaller components. And truly being able to put together a P&L against each, each aspect of the guest experience and understand what it means. And then in the end, you're beginning to marry the financial picture and the guest experience picture and try and understand what it means. And you're looking at it across time also because that change, those relationships are not permanent. They're not static. They change as time goes on, as, as people have different experiences in their lives and as the competition does other things. So you've got to be constantly looking at and reacting to all of these things in real time. Next one is um, from Karima, she's joining live. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me properly? Are we good? Yes, <laughs> all right. Yes. So, hi, Mr. Lansbury. I'm Prima. Um, I know you can't really see my colleagues right now, but we're all really happy to have you with us. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to meet you, even if it is virtually. Um, my first trip to Disney in Florida sorry in florida was um when i was five and we kind of went there every year until i was in high school and it's the only place my parents claim they're not parents so um keeping on the fun track and kind of like laying away from um the serious business questions what disney character do you most relate to and why <laughs> probably goofy because i'm a little goofy um uh, <laughs> it's um, nah, Goofy always kind of been my favorite character. Um, all that being said, I kind of like Captain Jack too. He's he's <laughs> kind of a fun guy. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. One is from Marina. Hi, Mr. Lansbury. Uh, Thanks for with us today and for. It's a great honor and opportunity for us. Um, my name is Marina, I'm from Russia, and uh, my question to you today is as a manager, as a top manager, um, because we're all interested in, in a career opportunity with your company. 
What qualities an employee do you value the most in your team? What helps you understand that the employee has a true Disney gene and will become an essential team part? So I'm going to give you two things. One is honesty, um, because it, you know, honesty and transparency, you really want people who are going to tell you the truth um, and ensure that, uh, and, and by the way, a lot of times it's hard, it's hard to find folks that will tell you the truth um, and, and will stick with it. But the single biggest piece that's probably the key to the Disney gene, I think, is being able to park your ego. <clears throat> and by that, I mean, Disney is a company that uh, people tend to be in it and to work there for the greater good. You know, we're not necessarily in it for ourselves. I mean, everybody likes a paycheck, and don't get me wrong, everybody likes getting paid at the end of the day. But it's a company where if that's all you're in it for, that tends to get sniffed out over time. And people tend to work at Disney because they view Disney as having a bit of a greater calling. It's not just a job. We are truly there to make people happy and to improve lives. And if what you're in it for is nothing but yourself, the organization over time just sort of begins to close in on you. And I've watched this happen over the years uh, to, to many people where you know that they were truly just in it for themselves so it's a it's a i think you've got to be able to park your ego and truly be in it for the greater good and that is the disney gene that probably um, helps people be successful in this company over time great so tina has uh, the next questions Hi, Mr. Lansbury. My name is Tina. I am born and raised in New York City. Thank you for taking the time to answer our question. My question is, what is the best piece of advice you got before getting your first job? Three aspects here. One, be helpful and be ready to step in and serve. Um, uh, two, I would say, uh, be ready to listen <clears throat> and learn. NYU is giving you guys a great education. But as I described it earlier, NYU is essentially putting tools in a toolbox for you. And they've taught you the basics of how to use them. But it takes you years of practice with those tools to truly be a craftsman or a craftswoman, a craftsperson, maybe even better way to say it. And so that aspect just takes time. So give yourself the time. And recognize it takes time for you to truly be that great craftsman and go in and listen. The other thing I would note is assume good intent on the part of others. And it was a lesson that I had to learn kind of the hard way. But one of the things you begin to recognize as you get older is the older people get, the more they listen and the more quiet they are. And it's not because their brains are working all that much slower. It's because... Um, they now realize they don't know they don't know nearly what they thought they knew you you may graduate and feel like i know this much about the topic the reality is you know this much about the topic and oftentimes the game you're watching is not the game being played in the background so it's about going in and trying to learn and understand what's truly going on in the background and how all of this stuff begins to knit together inside of a company it takes time you're not going. You're not going to know it right out of the gate. So those are the three pieces of advice I would give anybody coming out of school. I'm sorry. My name is Hong Yu, and I was graduating last year. And like all new graduate students, I'm struggling with finding jobs. Um, so you have been working at this business for over 35 years. So you might share with me <laughs> why you think, and also how did you plan your career path when you were our age? Thank you. Yeah, um, and I answered a bit of this one early at the be very beginning around, you know, I came to Disney without really having any affinity for the brand. Um, and 
but I came because it was a place I could get a really strong foundation in business. And I didn't count on being here 36 years later. I count on probably staying three to five years to build that foundation. So a piece of advice I would give you guys is recognize that what you are trying to do with your first job is, you know, land a job that is going to help you build a really strong foundation going forward. You've got a very long career in front of you. Um, and I foresee all of you being very successful, but getting that foundation built right out of the gate is important. So recognize that and take the job you can get to go build that foundation. Don't just take the job that's gonna pay the most right now because it may not be the thing that is best for you over the long term. So think long term with what you're doing. The other thing I would say is I didn't really plan my career path. I had, I would have loved to have gotten to the role that I'm in. Um, and I'm very grateful for the role that I'm in and the privilege of you know serving the company at this level. But I didn't really plan this out and say, okay, I'm going to do this job, then I'm going to do that job, and this one, and this one, and that's going to get me to where I am today. I, I had a few mentors. I um, you know, listened. I had great interest in various aspects of the business. And my goal was just learn. And every single job that I was taking, especially right out of the gate, is how much can I learn? And how much can I contribute? And a lot of times it means taking the job nobody else wants. And there were there have been a few times in my career where I took that job. And it was the truly the job nobody wanted because it was really hard. And it was the one where I went in and I learned the most in the end. And I was able to make the biggest difference. And so sometimes taking the job nobody wants. Is the, it, people don't want it because it requires a tremendous amount of hard work and a tremendous amount of effort. And Bob Iger has had a saying in the past about, you know, sometimes people say it's impossible because it just takes too much trying in the end. And the reality is you can do just about anything if you really put your mind to it you try, and you try hard enough. So try hard. All right, I think we're gonna close on those uh, those notes. They're very powerful, wise words, Kevin, um, to our students. And I think any emerging professional uh, to, to reflect on. Uh, we're, I was thinking we're all gonna have to be Imagineers here and uh, imagine a classroom full of students because we never really got to see them and enjoy them. But- um, um, Let's do this sound though, Mike. Don't, don't. Yeah, let's go now. <laughs> Well, we got some clapping and cheering for you, Kevin. So uh, thank that's you. appreciated. Um, it, it's I, been great. Yeah, I just want to thank you uh, very much on behalf of the school uh, for sharing these thoughts and tackling, you know, some uh, tough questions about pricing and culture and global growth. And you know, I, I know these are things that are not easily, uh, you know, always sort of bucketed into uh, trite answers. And as you indicated on many occasions. A lot of the decisions you have to make as a leader are very context specific and um, you know change even over time and and over cultures and uh and uh, you know fascinating insight actually to the story you were telling about linabel and how these different cultural references and cultural nuances and what succeeds in one place doesn't necessarily succeed in another and i think that's very much what we um you know teach at the school and i'm pleased that you're able to reinforce some of those messages um, a survey will go out after the, uh, this to all the participants. Uh, please share your feedback with us. Um, we also want to uh, let you know that the next speaker that George has invited is Joanna Price, who heads uh, communications, public affairs and sustainability, the Coca-Cola company. We're really uh, pleased to welcome her. Obviously discussions of uh, you know, people, profit and planet are critical to marketers and business leaders today. And then just finally, 